want to welcome you to our Wednesday night Bible study here at Carlisle Baptist Church. And as you know, we are in a verse by verse study of the book of James. And tonight we're going to be in James chapter 2, looking at verses 14 through 26. And so if you are watching this and you have your Bibles handy, then turn and follow along. James chapter 14. Verses, uh, James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. And let me just say that these are verses that deal with faith. And not just any faith, but true faith. Now, from that statement, the assumption that we are obviously drawn to make is that there is a false faith. And so the question that we have to ask ourselves is, what kind of faith do we have? Is it a true faith or is it a false faith? How do we know that we're really saved? I like what one particular writer I read said. He said, salvation is like the measles. If you really have it, it's going to pop out on you. And in our scripture before us, this is basically what James is saying. If a person is a true believer, then you can look at his or her life and you will see evidence. Of it. And so what James does is he presents this to us by means of a comparison. He speaks of real faith as opposed to false faith. And in so doing, he shows us the difference between mere profession of faith and true possession of faith. Now, before we get into it, let me just say that these are verses that have sparked uh, many theological debates over the years in that there are those who say that what James is saying here is in direct contradiction to what the Apostle Paul had to say in the book of Ephesians in chapter 2 verses 8 and 9 where he said for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves it's a gift of God not of works lest any man should boast so Paul says that man is saved by faith but then James comes along in verse 24 and says, you see then how that by works a man is justified. And so the question we have to ask is, which is it? Are we saved by faith or are we saved by work? And the answer is we're saved by faith and faith alone. But what you have to understand is that James in our scripture isn't talking about the requirement for salvation. He's talking about the result of salvation. He's not saying that works are the prerequisite for salvation. He's saying that works are the proof of it. He says that a person's salvation will be evidenced in the life that they live. And in laying this out for us, he talks about three different kinds of faith. And this is what I want us to look at in our study tonight. And the first of these that he mentions is a meaningless faith. A meaningless faith. He talks about those who profess salvation with their lips, but don't practice it in their lives. In other words, he says there's no proof of it. Look, if you will, at what he says, verse 14. What does it profit, my brethren? Though a man say he hath faith and have not works. Now, the key word in that verse is the word say. What good does it do to say you have faith if you do not have work? See, James is describing for us a person who says that he is saved, who claims that he is saved. But there is a monumental difference between merely professing salvation and actually possessing. See, many people who say they're saved really aren't. I like what old brother Vance Havner used to say. He said, saying you're saved doesn't make you a Christian any more than sleeping in a garage makes you a car. You see, that's what James is saying here. Now, two things he talks about. First of all, he talks about a false profession. Again, in verse 14, he says, what does it profit, my brethren? Though a man say he have faith and have not works, can faith save him? Now, James asked 
two questions in that verse. First, what does it profit a person to say that they have faith and yet they don't have works? And the word profit that he uses means benefit. In other words, what benefit is there in a person making such a statement? The implied answer is none. The second question he asks is, can faith save him? And in the Greek, what it literally says is, can that kind of faith save him? A faith without work. And again, the answer is no. See, James is saying just because a person claims to be saved, that doesn't mean that he is. If there are no works to back it up, then his is a false profession. You know, like John Calvin, the great reformer of the 16th century said it is faith alone that justifies but the faith that justifies is never alone that's what James is saying here and in verses 15 and 16 he gives us an example of this look at what he says verse 15 if a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food if they need clothing or if they need Food and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body, then what doth it profit? Now, this is a very powerful picture that he's painting here. A person who is in need approaches a professing Christian and asks them for help. He's cold and in need of a coat. He's hungry and he's in need of food. And what's the reaction of the professing Christian? Good luck to you. Hope you get what you need. James says that person may profess to be a Christian, but he certainly doesn't prove it by his works, by his reaction. And the conclusion he comes to in verse 17 is even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead. The word is lifeless. A person may profess to be saved, but James says it's a false profession. But he not only talks about a false profession, but also a futile profession. A futile profession. Look at verse 19. He says, Thou believest there's one God, thou doest well. Now, the point he's making is that the Bible teaches that in order for a person to be saved, he has to believe in Jesus Christ. But what James is going to say is that belief alone isn't enough because the rest of the verse, he says the demons also believe and tremble. James says demons believe in Jesus Christ. That's amazing. There's, there's not an atheist, not an agnostic among the whole bunch of them. They all believe in Jesus and tremble. But are they saved? Of course not. Of course not. Now, see, theirs is nothing more than an intellectual belief. They give mental assent to the fact that there is a God, that Jesus Christ is who he says he is. But they certainly never accepted him as Lord and Savior of their life. And so what he's saying is possible for a person to believe in Jesus and yet be lost. In order to be saved, one has to believe on him. One must take his, uh, place his faith and trust in Jesus and Jesus alone for salvation. Look at verse 20. He says, but wilt thou, O vain man, the word is foolish, wilt thou, O foolish man, know that faith without works is dead? And so what he's saying is that the absence of works reveals a kind of faith a person has. And he says that it's a meaningless faith. That's the first kind he mentioned. But not only does he talk about a meaningless faith, he also in the second place talks about a useless faith, a useless one. Now, look, if you will, at verse 18. He says, yea, a man may say, you have faith, I have works. Show me your faith without your works. I'll show you my faith by my work. He's simply saying here that works give evidence to our faith. They give evidence to who? To God? No. I don't have to prove my faith to God. God knows the kind of faith I have. 
but I do have to prove it to others. Now, let's think about this. How, how do we know whether someone is saved or not? Is it because of what they say or is it because of what we see? Well, the answer is obvious. The reason that we believe someone is saved is because they give evidence of that salvation in their life. Now, immediately someone says, hold up, wait just a minute. The Bible says, judge not. And that's true. It does say that. We're not to judge. Listen, Jesus said a person's works are what judge them. I want you to listen to what Jesus said. Back in Matthew chapter 7, beginning with verse 18, Jesus said, a good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and, and is cast into the fire. Wherefore, he says, by their fruits, by their works, you shall know them. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. And that's what James is saying here. The reason we doubt whether someone is saved or not is, is simply because of what is not seen in their life. They have no testimony. Reminded of the story of two old country boys who were talking one day on the side of the road. One of them had a coon dog with it. And the other one said, uh, how much you take for that dog there? The guy said, I'll take, I'll take 100 bucks for him. The guy said, all right. Took out a checkbook, started to write him a check. The guy said, hold up, I, I don't want a check. The guy said, don't worry about it, the check's good. He said, I'm a, I'm a trustee at the Methodist Church. And the old boy thought about it for a while, and he said, okay. And so he took the check and handed the guy his dog. Well, the next day he was talking to a friend of him and asked him what a trustee at the Methodist Church was. The guy said, well, I'm not sure. I think it may be like a deacon in a Baptist church. The old boy said, well, shoot. I'm out a hundred bucks and a dog. Now, we know that nothing like that would apply to our deacons here at Carlisle. Unfortunately, there are those who hurt the name of Christ by a poor testimony. But what James is saying is that many poor testimonies are the result of a dead faith. See, if a person is truly saved, their life is going to give evidence to it. And if that evidence is not there, then we have every reason to believe that they're lost. It's a useless faith. That's the second thing that he tells us. And then the third and last thing, he not only talks about a meaningless faith and a useless faith, but he talks about a priceless faith, a priceless faith which is a possession rather than a profession. In other words, it's the real deal. It's like Tyler Ford. Seen that commercial on TV? They're the real deal. Well, in the following verses, James gives two examples of this kind of faith. First of all, he talks about the dynamic faith of Abraham, and he talks about two events that happened in his life. Look at verse 23. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. Now that's a reference back to Genesis chapter 15, when God promised Abraham he would give him a son, and through him all nations of the world would be blessed. And the word said Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. And at that point, because of his faith, he was saved. All right? Look at the second event, verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? That is a reference to Genesis 22. One of the greatest moments in Abraham's life when he took his only son Isaac up on to Mount Moriah to offer him up as a sacrifice in obedience to God's command. In Genesis 15, he was saved by faith in Genesis 22. He demonstrated his faith by his action. That's why he says in verse 22, Seest thou how faith wrought with his work? And by works was faith made perfect. It arrived at its intended goal. But not only does he talk about the dramatic faith of Abraham, he talks about the dynamic faith of Rahab. 
You see, he, he moves from Abraham the Jew to Rahab a Gentile, from a patriarch to a prostitute. Look at verse 25. He says, likewise also in the same manner was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and sent them out another way. Now, here, here's the story. Rahab had heard what God had done for the people of Israel, how he had dried up the waters of the Red Sea, how that he had utterly destroyed the two kings of the Amorites. And as a result, she believed in God and said, hey, he's a God of heaven and in, of earth. She believed in him and justified by her faith. But what did she do to prove her faith? She hid the spies and helped them to escape. By her faith, she was justified before God. By her works, she was justified before people. You know, in the ancient world, whenever a person would find someone who appeared to be dead, what they would do is they would put a mirror under the person's nose. And if no vapor appeared, then that was conclusive proof that that person was dead. Well, James concludes with the same thought in verse 26. He says, for as the body without the spirit, the word is breath, for as the body without the breath is dead, so faith without works is dead also. You know, James says it's one thing to say you have faith. But it's another thing to prove it by your life. You've heard the old saying, the proof of the pie is in the pudding. Well, James says the proof of our faith is in our work. So, in closing, what kind of faith do you have? Is it real faith or is it a false faith? That's the problem with so many people in the world today. So many people in the church today. They may say, I believe in God, but their lives don't back it up. That's, that's our study tonight. Next week, we're going to look at chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. You, you bow with me as we go forward. Father, we do thank you for this time of study tonight in your word. We ask you, Lord, just to uh, place it upon our heart. Lord, help us to look at our own lives. Lord, help us to, to, to know for sure that we've truly been saved and that people can look at us and know we've been saved by the way that we live our life. We thank you for loving us. We ask your blessings upon each one of our members, those who cannot be together tonight. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.